All right. Welcome to the Legends of Boxing Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network, brought to you by the Retired Boxers Foundation and MyBookie.ag. I'm your host for the Legend Show, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I want to welcome in our guest today. He is the former WBA light welterweight champion. Help me welcome to the Grueling Truth, Johnny Bumpus. How you doing, Johnny? Oh, I'm doing all right. How about you? <laughs> uh, doing great. Glad to have you on the show today. Um, and, and I know I mentioned off air the Tacoma Boxing Club. I know there was a lot of great fighters there, especially back in the 60s, 70s, early 80s, guys like Leo Randolph, yeah. Rocky Lockridge, Sugar Ray Seals. And I read you started boxing when you were eight years old at the Tacoma Boxing Club. Yeah, down on 25th and D Street, Tacoma Boys Club. Joe Plow was my trainer. Yeah, and that was, like I said, that produced a ton of Olympians. 72, you had Seals. 76, you had Leo Randolph, who won a gold medal. So were the Olympics always your goal? Because I figure you probably started, what, late 60s, saw these guys winning gold medals? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I really set my sights on going to the Olympics after Sugar Ray winning 70, 72. And then uh, 76 was Leo and, and uh, Davey Armstrong. And I was too young for them at that time. So I set my sights on the 80 Olympics. And, of course, I made the Olympic team. But we got boycotted, so that really that really was a setback, and that really that really hurt inside because you know that was my dream to get the Olympics. Yeah, and that ended up the boycott accomplished nothing, anyways. And I know that President Carter, I think, had all you guys at the White House, gave you gold medals. Did you ever just want to walk up to him and say, "What the hell are you doing"? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was, I was, it was like I was in awe by being at the White House. So, so, uh, you know, because at, 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 at the time before I got there, those were my thoughts. It's, Man, what the hell are you doing? Man, you know, took us out of the Olympics and a lot of us went for, are trained so hard at, to make the Olympic team and to have it just taken away. And then it didn't prove anything. It didn't do anything, you know? So it was really, really upsetting and hurtful to me. Yeah, and 1980, I know I had Alex Ramos on, who was a teammate of yours that should have been in that also. But 1980 was a rough year for amateur boxing in the United States. You also had a plane crash where you lost Sarge Johnson and numerous other former teammates. Um, what was yeah, that exactly. effect for you? Because from what I heard is you were on that same plane like 10 or 12 hours before that. Exactly. I would. Uh, I had a tri I had a choice between a trip to Germany and the trip to uh, Poland, and I chose Germany. And uh, you know, prior to the uh, we that exact plane that crashed is a plane that we got off in New York. Yeah. And uh, it, I think it crashed like 16 hours later. So man, that was really heartbreaking not just that it crashed but man that could have been me yeah and i'd imagine at least for a while that had to be a little bit difficult to deal with that all these guys died and you weren't there and you could have been exactly i was like man how did i uh you know why you know why i didn't choose that trip because germany's because nicer to Pol <laughs> germany's nicer to uh -huh. poland <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not only that, I, I knew the German is not as strong as the Polish fighter. I fought that Polish fighter a couple of years back, and man, I had hell with him. Yeah. He won, as a matter of fact. Oh, he won in uh, 80 in Moscow? No, the, uh, the, yeah, no, he won. He, when I fought him, uh, I fought him like two years earlier. Oh, he beat you. And he okay. beat me. And he beat me, so I said, I ain't in no hurry to go over there. That guy is pretty strong. I better go to Germany. <laughs> yeah, and I think the greatest time for amateur boxing in the U.S. was probably from the early 70s up to about the mid-80s. You had the great 76 team, the great 84 team. 
and what I think would have been a great 80 team if you guys would have got the chance. But who was your toughest yeah. amateur opponent? That Polish guy. That I don't even know his name, but I fought that guy. That was the strongest part I ever fought. I know, you know, they always say that the uh, European fighters are strong, and they are, but, you know, that lateral movement gets them. But for some reason, this guy, I couldn't figure him out right away. You know, by the middle of the second round, I, you know, I was outboxing him, but he was so strong that that uh, that was a very tough fight. Yeah, and I think amateur boxing has come down to where it's almost nothing. I remember back in the early 80s, you had ABC Wild World of Sports, Howard Cosell, they'd do the old U.S. against Cuba, U.S. against the Soviets. And I think that is why the, the lack of that nowadays is why I think the American boxers overall have really fallen off and fallen behind the Europeans and even English fighters. Yeah, I believe so, too, because uh, we used to have the matches uh, USA against different countries. I can remember back in 78 um, when I was fighting against uh, Germany. I think it was Germany and New York and the Garden, and uh, it was on TV. And uh, I can remember how it was still saying, look at this kid from Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was ten. I was putting the whooping on that fighter. All right. I remember. So, I, mean, I, I wish I still had the, some of the tapes from from when I was, you know, fighting on the U.S. team. I, I imagine I could get a hold of them if I tried hard enough. But you know, I, I have actually found a lot of those in the last few days just on YouTube. There's a guy that's got a channel on there that's got a ton of stuff. I don't know if there's much from the late seventies. But I know huh. up to like 19, I think like 80, 81, 82, there's a bunch of it there. But uh, right. let's go ahead. And, and the thing that really had to disturb you with the boycott is you had guys in 76 like Sugar Ray Leonard, Michael Spanks, Leon Spanks that made millions of dollars coming directly out of the Olympics. Um, exactly. Can, can you tell us a little bit? I think, were you with Shelly Finkel? Yeah, I was with Shelly Fink or Lou Duvio. Yeah. All right, so what was your relationship with Shelly and Lou like? Well, I didn't know Shelly as well as I did Lou. Um, coming out to find out, I don't even know if I should mention this, but I am. Lou Duvio turned out to be a crook. Yeah. You're you not know, the first fighter that's been on here and said that, so. Every every championship fight, that I, I had five championship fights. And I made a million dollars for each of them. And don't you know he he gave me told me I was making a hundred thousand. So he he is a crook. Yeah. You know, God rest his soul, he is a crook. Let it be known that he is a freaking crook. All right. We, we had Vinny Pazienza on the show a year or two ago, and he wasn't a big fan either of Lou. So when you look at it, what do you remember about your pro debut? Oh man, it was on ABC Wide World of Sports. It was real nice. I, matter of fact, I knocked a guy in the second, third round. Boy, I, no, it was the first round. I never will forget it. The first, my, oh you know, man, that was, that was like, whoa. Uh, 1980, my first debut, and I knocked a guy out on TV in the first round. And that was on ABC? So, what were your dealings with yeah. Howard Cosell like? Oh, man, I liked Howard, you know, because I, I, he was uh, – that's all you would see on TV he was, look at Howard. This is Howard Cosell. You know how he talked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was – I was oh, I guess, you know, being in his presence. But one thing about it, I had, been, I had already been – met him prior to that on the U.S. team. Yeah. Okay, um, and the other thing I noticed about your record is, I mean, in your fifth professional fight, I think that was on NBC Sports World against Victor Papa, and Victor came in. He was seventeen and one. Usually, you don't see too many guys at four and zero fighting a guy in their fifth fight that had that kind of a record. Right, right. Um, when I fought Victor, that was that was a good fight. Though I think I won the USBA title from him. Yeah. I don't. I think I was. I had more fights than five, though. 
Pick the Papa was pretty tough. I uh, now, I, I'm, I'm looking sure at I'm looking five. at box rec, and it was your fifth fight. It was he was 17 and one going into it. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was a good fight. As a matter of fact, it was tough for a while. <laughs> yeah, I think I I took him out in the later rounds. I think. Yeah. All right, and then yeah. I, I mean the first time that I think people your big name opponent first one I can remember really was Randy Shields. Randy was a tough guy. Had went eleven, twelve rounds with Tommy Hearns. What do you remember about your fight with Randy Shields? Randy Shields, he was I don't know. He he wasn't that tough to me really. For some reason I just you know I, I'm not gonna remember my dad. Trying one of the best dads in the business and. And then Dab just took over the fight. And I think I knocked him on about the eighth round. Yeah. I know that was towards the end of his career, but, I mean, it's still an impressive win for where you were at your stage of your career. Uh, and I know that I had Buddy McGirt on a couple of days ago, and he was talking about he thought Georgie Benton was the greatest trainer of all time. And I know Georgie, right. you worked with Georgie a lot. Um, what was your relationship yeah. like with Georgie? Oh, Georgie was my trainer. Whenever I fight, I go to Philadelphia and train in at Joe Frazier's gym, which is a gym that uh, Georgie was working out of. Oh, I love Georgie. He was a good trainer. I, I learned a lot from him. Yeah, I, th- I think there's no doubt he's one of the greatest fighters of all time. And what was the experience like at Joe Frazier's gym? Oh, man, I was at awe at first, you know, because – that was back in the 80s, and back in the 80s, just, Joe Frazier, just, he hadn't retired too much earlier, you know, and uh, I even uh, trained with, with his sons. Oh, uh, Marvis? He had Marvis. Yeah. Marvis Frazier used to train there, and uh, then I can't remember his other little son. He was, he was adopted, but he was a little tough fighter, too. Yeah, and then after the Shields fight, you went on, you fought Loretto Garcia, who knocked you down in the fourth round. But basically, from what yeah. I remember to that fight, he was just trying to survive. And it had to be kind of frustrating to you because it's hard to look real good against a guy that's fighting like that. Yeah, the way he fought kind of was frustrating. And I had to keep my cool and not just go in there because that's what he was waiting for you to go come in there and he catch you with a nice shot. Because he was a good boxer. But a boring boxer, you know. He wouldn't fight, but he they were boring fights. I could tell that. That uh, he was just waiting for me to try to open up so he could sneak one in. And as a matter of fact, that's what he did in that fourth round. You know, I tried to open up a little bit, and bam, there it went. But after he knocked me down, oh, I had to get with his butt, man. I, <laughs> this is not going on, man. I'm coming wrong with this title. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that had to be special, especially since you didn't get to go pursue your dream of an Olympic gold medal to finally be the WBA light welterweight champion. Um, what were your feelings when that fight was over? Oh, man, it was, I was especially after they announced the decision because, you know, I was thinking about that knockdown and how they were going to score it. But I felt that I was, you know, ahead on the scorecards. But you never know these days. But when they called it out, man, that was the best thing I ever had. Oh, I think that's the feeling you have any days is just the the fact that even – boxing is still the only sport where you can watch the entire match and have to wait for somebody yeah. to tell you who won. Yeah, yeah, because one guy could be ahead, and all it takes is one punch to change the fight. Yeah, or the other person just has the correct promoter, and you don't. Things can change. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Uh, All right, then your first title defense in Buffalo, you fought Gene Hatcher, who I think has to be about the luckiest man in the world. Um, you got but that al- right. also from what I read and a lot of your problems came from, you had a hard time making weight for that fight. Yeah. Yeah. The, the plan was to win the title and move up. But like I said, like I said, Lou Duva, you know, he saw that, you know, they were going to give me a million dollars for that fight. And, uh, he could go sign and, and tell me I'm making 150000 when I actually made a million dollars. 
that's probably why he took the fight because I told him that, you know, after winning the title, I'm going to go ahead and move up. And after losing the title, I did move up. Yeah, and the fight was in Buffalo. It was a big card, too, big crowd. I think that was on the undercard of the Livingstone Bramble, Ray Mancini first encounter. And the fight yeah. was stopped way too soon. It did look like you were starting to get a little weak. And, but I still, when I watched that fight, I think you should have been allowed to at least attempt to continue. Right. Yeah, I thought I, thought I could continue. I was so mad with the referee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I Refer- not referees are another problem. That's a problem in all sports also, though, I believe. Uh, all right, you moved up after the Hatcher fight, and you won, I think, six or seven fights in a row at welterweight. Did you feel more comfortable at welterweight? Were you stronger? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's why I moved up and, and uh, then I fought for the USBA welterweight title. Yeah, against Marlon Starling. I think that was in Providence. Um, yeah. So what do you remember about that? I remember you got badly cut from an accidental headbutt at the close of, I believe, the sixth round, the fight was stopped in between rounds, and I know that Starling's manager protested. He contended that the referee was influenced by Lou Duva because that's one of the fights where they were trying to open scoring, and they knew you guys were up by three or four points. What was your take on that fight and the decision to stop that? Well, I I, I, I thought that it should have been stopped because, you know, uh, he was head with me the whole time, the whole fight. And I felt like I was winning, so, you know, why not let him stop it and yep. go to the scorecards? Because I knew I was ahead. I was tearing his ass up. Yeah, like I said, I think there was one judge that had you up by a point, but the other two had you up by three or four, and you dominated that fight. And Marlon Starling was a really good fighter, so that had to give you some confidence right there. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I um uh, I was I was I felt good after that, you know. USBA champion. Not only that, but I thought I'd be a very good fighter too. Yeah. And then you go to Wembley, um, Grand Hall at Wembley. You fought Lloyd Hunnigan for the welterweight championship. And what I remember about that fight is I haven't seen it in a while, but if I remember right, he ran across the ring and hit you before the first bell even sounded. Exactly, exactly. I was sitting between the first and second round before I got off the stool. Lou Du was still in the ring. He ran across the ring and hit me. He should have been disqualified, and we should have fought again. Yeah, um, and, and I know after that fight, you ended up retiring at the age of 27, a young age to retire. Uh, what was the reason for that? A medical reasons. My equilibrium was diagnosed as being off. Yeah. Is that something that you still have trouble with today, or has that cleared up since yeah, you stopped? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still, I still have trouble with it today. I walk with a cane. Yeah. So, but that could be due to the fact that I had uh, cancer in my spine, and they removed the uh, they removed the disc that was cancerous, and uh, I've been walking crazy since then. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, w- was it hard to adjust? I would think it would be hard to adjust, not being able to fight anymore, and you were only 27 years old, and that's what you'd been doing since you were little. Oh, yeah, it was definitely hard to adjust to. You know, I uh, the best thing that happened to me at that time was getting the trainer's position. Now, I worked down, down in Florida for about 10 years training fighters, and I made a couple of champions, and my my biggest claim to fame is, is uh Kasim Omar. I made him junior middleweight champion and uh that was my biggest claim to fame as a trainer. And now I'm still trying to get back into training. Now, um I have a couple I got two nephews that are in the game and I think I wanna I mean I know I want to take over and train them. They're not really they don't really have good trainers but you know, they're getting by. Yeah. Um, are they amateurs right now, or have they turned professional? No, they're turned professional. One of them is like, he's four, five and one, and the other one is like uh, nine and one. Yeah. Or nine wins and one draw. 
All right. So what else occupies your time these days? Do you still watch boxing? Oh, definitely. Whenever someone on TV, I'm I'm, I'm right there for show. So, uh, who are some, who are some oh, of your now, favorite who are some of your favorite fighters to watch now? Um, actually, I don't really have any favorites right now. I just I just watch who's ever on. Yeah, what's your I take just, on a guy just, like Vasil Lomachenko? Um, I don't know. I I don't even know if I've seen him. <laughs> you know, that light heavyweight Germany? No, he, Germany, he's right? the now he's the smaller guy from Kazakhstan, I think it was, somewhere over there, but in Asia or Europe. <laughs> but he's the one that fought Guillermo Rigondeau a couple weeks ago. Rigondeau quit on him. Oh. No, I didn't even see that. But all right. So when you look back at your career, is there anything that you regret that you would have wished you would have done differently? I wish I would have. I I wish I would have went on and and stuck my. I wish that I would have checked with my. How should I say this? Went to went to the went to the signing of all my fights, you know, because those five million dollars, man, I'm so broke right now. I could use that money, man. Yeah. I could use that money. I think I think me and Rocky made main events. Because they were doing the same thing to Rocky. Talk about Rocky. And Rocky Lockridge. had more. Yeah, Rocky Lockridge had more championship fights than I did, and they was getting both of us. Man, you know, God rest his soul. But you know, and I, and I, I don't want to have a resentment against this guy, which I do, and I can't get rid of it. But I mean, what can you say? You know what I'm saying? That's a lot of money. Well, and the bad thing is, Johnny, there's a lot of boxers, and they didn't just work with Lou Duva, that have been taken advantage of over the years. And, I mean, there something needs to be done about it. There needs to be a national boxing commission that can take care of these guys. Something needs to be done, because if you go to a place like Kentucky or Wisconsin, I mean, they don't even really have a real boxing commission. Right, and the fighters are basically forced to fend for themselves. And let's face it, your boxing career usually you're done by your late thirties at the latest. In your case, late twenties, and there should be something that you can fall back on, some sort of a pension or something. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They should. Uh, they should. Uh, especially, you know, top ten fighters are world champions and. I mean, you leave the game and you don't have nothing. And when you when you really should have millions, that that really hurts me a lot. I think about it all the time. All the money that they took from me, and at that time didn't there was no main events. I mean, they had a little a uh, little office, and they made they they came up off of me. Yeah, they, they came, came up, up off, off me of and you my, and what the tomorrow's champions. Yep, tomorrow's champions came up for of me and Rocky Lockridge. Yeah. Man, it's a damn shame. I mean, Rocky was a great fighter, and it's a shame to see how everything ended up for him. And it just seems like people, if if you're making people a ton of money, I don't know why they want to take it all. Yeah, they want it all, yeah. Yeah, and I right. never, for some reason, I never, I never. I tell you one thing. I tell you, in seventy, no, that was in uh like eighty five, eighty six. I wonder why Evander Holyfield left Lou Duba. Well, now I, I know. I, yeah, I would say they tried, they tried, tried to do that to Evander. They tried to do that to Evander. Evander had people that you know stayed up on top of his his money. So, so he let the Lou do go. Yeah. He ran the holy field. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me. Um, like I said, you're not the first boxer that I've talked to that was not a big fan of Lou. Uh, I'm making no judgment. I know nothing about it. All I know is this. I know a lot of this stuff happens to fighters, whether it's Don King or Bob Arum. We all know that these guys are sharks that are trying to line their own pockets. But you know what? I never, I never heard 
of Don King taking the money that Lou Dewey took from me. I've heard of Don King, uh, you know, getting a little something, something, but man, can you, I'm talking about you give the guy 150000 and he's getting a million? Yeah. I, I've heard of a couple stories real similar with Don, though, no, but I've also talked to guys like I interviewed Ernie Shavers last night who had nothing but great things to say about Don, so... Right. I guess it could go yeah. either way, and maybe he just wasn't a crook all the time. Right. <laughs> but, hey, Johnny, it, it was great to have you on. I grew up watching Tomorrow's Champions, watching Howard Cosell with the U.S. against Cuba, the U.S. against Russia. I really appreciate yeah. you stopping in today and taking some time out to talk to us. All right. You have a good day, man. I appreciate it. I love talking to you all. All right. Thanks a Call lot, Johnny. Anytime. We'll have you back on sometime. All right. Do that for sure. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. All right, guys. I want to remind you, you can hear all of the Legends of Boxing shows on thegruelingtruth.net. We posted Ron Stander, former heavyweight contender yesterday. Uh, Mark Breland will be on sometime in the next couple of days. You can look for that also. And, of course, we got Johnny. Um, we had George Foreman a couple weeks ago. We have some huge plans to interview as many big-time boxers as we can. I want to thank, once again, the Retired Boxers Foundation and Alex Ramos, who has done a great job of helping us get some of these guys. Old featherweight contender Ruben Castillo has helped us get some guys. Um, yeah, and Bill Kaplan for getting us George Foreman. So make sure you keep an eye out on thegruelingtruth.net in the new year. Also, next week, we'll have our Inside Boxing Weekly Show where I'll have our yearly awards winners with myself, John Einrein Hoffer, and, of course, Jeremiah Pricer, and probably a couple surprise guesses there. Remember, you can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find sports podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. So for Johnny Bumpus, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.